uh, developing the framework for a family component. Ah, oh, God, how they call them. Now that we have discussed some of the basic definitions and rules of the family editor, we will talk about the hierarchy of creating a family component. In this section, you will work through the fundamentals of creating a family in terms of datum objects, constraints, parameters, materials, subcategories, and visibility settings. Later in the chapter, you will learn more advanced modeling and parametric techniques. Click the application menu and then select New Family. Use the Furniture RFT or Metric Furniture RFT Family Template, which is available for download with this chapter's exercise files from the book's web page. Well, I, I created a new template. I have two files open here. I have a, a new fa family called Family 3, which I created from the Furniture uh, RFT. So I'll also go to New family, we can see all the template files. And if you go down to furniture, RFT, right? I use that as a template file. And as you can see, there are many. And I opened, and that created a template called fam uh, a family called family three. And we can see these three views are open. But uh, in the next project, it wants us to take a look at the family called desk RFA, which I have open as well on the earth three views associated with that. Uh, so, if we take a look here, this is family three, and we have Z, W, T, Z, A, to get our bearings. All right, so this is family three. This is family three, family three, family three. And these two views are of the desk, which is a separate family, two different families. One we're working on, and one I opened up to look at. But they're both, um, going to be an RFI. This is the, it's going to be an RFA when you save it. It's a furniture template. That's just the way the book uh, has it going. All right, so creating the necessary reference planes, lines, and points. In the project environment, datum objects, such as this, are available for you to control and manage the location and behavior of model geometry. In previous chapters, we discussed the use of grids, levels, and reference planes, but this data is also extremely important in a component family when used in the family editor. Reference planes, lines, and points will function as a skeleton for the solid and void geometry that you build. And remember, uh, dimensions drive the geometry in a family. You don't see them when you bring them into a project, but they drive the geometry because they're, they're created as parameters. To be clear about the usage of datum objects and families, they are not required to construct geometry. However, if you are confident that what you are about to model in the family editor will need to flex, have a modifiable, modifiable length scale, uh, length, angle, location, and so on, from within the rules of the family, then it is important that you begin by first creating the rules that will allow the geometry to move. With few exceptions, you do not want to give parameters to the geometry itself. Instead, you will want to create the necessary reference planes, lines, and points first, then associate the parameters to these references, and whenever possible, test the parameters to make sure the references are flexing properly. Once you're confident the references are flexing, you can build the geometry in context to the references. Again, testing to make certain that when the references flex, the geometry is flexing as well. Reference planes. These define a single point that can be set to host sketch lines or geometry. They're best for controlling linear geometric relationships, that is to say, geometry that will flex in a linear fashion. Reference planes do not have endpoints. This is important because you do not want to use reference planes for controlling angular or directional relationships. As illustrated in the plan view of the desk, RFA family, the linear parameters of depth and width are appropriately assigned to reference planes. All these geometric constraints are parallel to one another. Well, if you look, the, the width dimension was changed to a parameter after it was drawn from this reference plane to this reference plane. Um, it was uh, also given an equidistant from center uh, dimension and it was given a width parameter. And 
you can see the same was um, holds true with the depth parameter. And as you can see, there are one, two, three, four, five parameters built into this one. So if I was to flex it, right, look at the parameters, you could see this desk, um, body material, laminate, ivory, mat, handle, leg material, steel, chrome plated, top material, cherry wood, depth, two foot six, height, two foot six, um, leg height six. If I was to make this leg height eight, Look at the figure in the lower left hand corner. Yeah. Hello, Moto. I hear a call. Can I just go back and forth? If I just go back and forth, you can see the legs uh, have been uh, are changing. And it made the top drawer a little smaller, if you see. Parametric, parametric relationship. All right, so. Um, all these geometric constraints are parallel to one another. Now, reference lines. By definition, these datum objects have endpoints and are great for controlling angular and directional relationships. They can have four axes of reference, two along the length of the line, which are perpendicular to each other, and one at each end that is perpendicular to the line. You can also create curve reference lines, but they have only planes that may be used for hosting at each end. There are no references along the curve line as shown, and we'll get to that. As an example, reference lines can be established in a family with length and angular dimension parameters to control path geometry for sweeps, such as the iterations shown um, in the previous exercises. And this is where all of these um, revolve, sweeps, and blends uh, come in, because if you look, we can create a path, a reference line, that uh, is a parameter uh, linked to, um, to drive the geometry. Uh, and you can see it works with uh, the sweeps as well. It works with the revolve. Anything you can think of to drive your geometry with a reference line, um, you can utilize that. And we're going to be practicing all of this. Now, reference points, if you remember, that this type of datum object is available only in certain family templates including mass, generic model adaptive, generic model pattern-based, and curtain panel, curtain panel pattern-based. Reference points have three planes that can be set to host sketch lines or geometry. You can also use a series of points to control a line or even a spline. Other objects, such as reference lines or other geometric surfaces, can also host reference points. You can select reference points in the draw panel in the ribbon. We don't have that type of adaptive model open right now, but we're going to open one up and, and we're going to go through each uh, of those um, applications utilizing uh, all of those, those references. Setting the behavior of reference planes and lines. When you place a new reference plane or line or select one already in your family, you will notice a property in the properties panel call, um, called is reference. This setting is an important factor in how the family will behave when it is place in a project, it affects how you can dimension or align to the family as follows. Not a reference. This, the reference will be used only to control geometry in the family editor. So if I was to select this, is reference, right? As you can see, defines origin. That's by selecting this one, right? Name, center left, right, is reference. Okay, so the, op the options you have, not a reference. The reference will be used only to control geometry in the family editor. 
weak reference, the reference can be assessed for measurement in the project environment only by pressing the tab key on the keyboard. Strong reference, the reference has the highest priority for dimensions and alignment. Temporary dimensions are displayed as the strong reference data. So as you can see, not a reference, strong and weak. In the family editor, reference planes also have other available values for the is reference property, including top, back, bottom, left, right, and front. These values are all strong references and are provided to help you better organize your family geometry. You will also notice that symbolic lines have a property called reference, with settings identical to those for the is reference property of reference planes and reference lines. We recommend that you treat symbolic lines with the same care as the datum objects. Now let's see if this family will allow us to create symbolic lines. Um, was it an annotation symbolic line? So if we were to create one, select it. it is reference? It's a weak reference. So let's undo that. It has the same. Uh, same values in the property, uh, in, in its properties. Now, um, we recommend that you treat symbolic lines with the same care as the data objects. Use the strong and weak references sparingly throughout your family. The default setting for the is reference property is weak reference. Therefore, there could be a large number of possibilities for measurement within every component in your project. For a strong or weak reference, Revit must analyze the reference when you are annotating or designing. Setting the insertion point. After you have chosen an appropriate family template, the rest is pretty flexible. If you make any mistakes, you will probably be able to recover most, if not all of your work, to correct the problem, but some considerations, considerations should come before others, which is why we believe that the insertion point is the next most critical criterion on your list for family creation. First, the insertion point determines the location about which the family will geometrically flex. But second, and often more importantly, the insertion point is a point of reference when two family components are exchanged. This is critical if the design family that you have used as a placeholder is being swapped out for something more specific at a later date. If the insertion points are not established similarly between families, the location of the new family will not agree with the location uh, of the old one. That makes sense. If you have two light fixtures that are two different families, and they're, let's say, one's a recessed can at six inches, even though, this is probably not a good example. Let's say you have two pieces of wall art, and one is a circle, and one is a square, and the insertion point for the circle is the center of the circle, and the center for the insertion point for the square is the midpoint between the vertexes of the uh, rectangle, and uh, I'll give you a demonstration. If here's the, uh, if here's the rectangle, well, and then here's the circle, its insertion point, this should be the same, right? If I move and get this synonymous with this, move this from the midpoint. Hold on. You follow my, my line of reasoning here? These two should be coplanar. So that if you swap out a circle wall on for a rectangular wall on, their insertion points are the same. And if they're off, then it's not going to insert in the same place. So we'll be able to swap out one family for the other um, correctly. That is important in ceilings, right? It's important everywhere, but it's really evident in a, in a ceiling if you're putting in, let's say, fixtures of acoustical ceiling tile or diffusers of fire alarm sprinkler heads or anything, uh, fire alarm components on walls, uh, you name it. Uh, it's applicable. So, yeah, it's critical. One of the, this is the next most critical criterion. If 
the insertion point, points are not established similarly between families, the location of the new family will not agree with the location of the old one. <laughs> it happens in families. <laughs> For example, most of the tables in the default weather furniture library define the insertion point at the center of the geometry. Right? And if you look at the new family, that reference level has two reference lines on it at the new family. Now, I'm not going to say that that's exactly where it is, but it does say that, for example, most of the tables in the default Revit furniture library define the insertion point at the center of the geometry, which just so happens to be here. If you place one table family in your project and then later decide to swap it for a different table family, there should be minimal disruption to the layout of other furniture in your design. The new family will appear in roughly the same spot as the original place family. Now, what happens if you were to download a table family from a web-based content provider? Will that table also follow the same convention for the location of the insertion point? This concern illustrates the importance of following published guidelines or standards for content creation. Keep in mind that changing the insertion point is easy. As you might expect, you do not move the geometry to the insertion point. And that's a huge, huge thing. And if you CAD folks are out there, you really shouldn't be moving your geometry around. I know I'm going off on a shared coordinate, published coordinates, acquired coordinates tangent, but you really shouldn't be moving your models. Keep in mind that changing the insertion point is easy, as you might expect. I hope so. You don't have to move the geometry to the insertion point. Rather, you simply select two reference planes and then make sure the defines origins parameter is selected in the properties palette. Continuing with this chapter's exercise, use the furniture RFT or metric furniture RFT template. The two reference planes provided already are assigned the defines origins property. You will now start to build the geometric framework around these reference lines, reference planes. Excuse me. Okay, so if we look at this reference plane. You click on it. Well, it doesn't say that it defines, it, it does right here, it defines origin. That one does. And so does this one, defines origin. Let's place some reference planes in the new family to officially begin the chapter exercise. Well, the new family, well, this is the existing. Let's see if they make us go back to the table. No, we're starting from scratch. So I'm just going to, uh, uh, I don't want to get confused. I'm going to close the table um, RFA, the desk, I should say. And now we have just, just our uh, family three, which we used from a furniture template open. Let me get rid of all this. Okay. Let's place some reference planes in the new family. We'll officially begin the chapter exercise. Activate the reference level floor plan in the project browser, which it is. From the create tab in the ribbon, click the reference plane command and sketch four new reference planes around the two existing reference planes as show, shown in figure dot 15.17. I'll show you right now from create reference plane, right? Not reference line, reference plane. And we're going to draw um, four more. So we're going to draw, if you come out like this, they have one way out in the breeze here, pretty far out though. I'm going to have to adjust these. So let's print this one way out here. And if you start and hover over, an existing one, you get a temporary dimension. And it'll start and stop with an extension line, vertical and extension. It'll give you a little bit of help. And then they have another one. If I start over here, you see how it knows dynamically, magnetically, to snap and give you a dynamic snap, object tracking, if you will, dynamic snap tracking in place. So I'll just give this one four foot and I'm probably going to adjust these a little bit. 
come down here. Uh, I can adjust these later on. That's four foot. I want to use it as a reference. Let me come down here. Come down here, four foot. As you can see, they're a little screwed up. We can take these now and you can drag them and get them a little more perpendicular to each other. And that one's pinned in place. But you can see this one's four foot, that one's four foot, this one's seven foot six, and this one's seven foot six. I can't manipulate this one because it's locked. And if I unpin it, I can drag its endpoint here. And that's pretty much how they have it. These are a little, this one's dragged and it's pinned. This one's a little further down. And that one's a little further down like that. This is still four feet, four feet, seven foot six, seven foot six. That's uh, a bit big, but I'll just hold it right there. We can adjust this down the road. All right, so the exact placement of the new planes does not matter for now. Select the reference plane you added to the left of the center plane. And in the properties palette, set its name parameter to left. In River 2018, you can select the reference plane and on both ends, you will see the words click to name or the predefined name uh, for the reference plane. Click this area and input the name. Well, I didn't even have to, I hovered over it. You see, it's now annotated left to give us uh, an idea. All right, now, assigning a name to a reference plane will allow you to use it later as a work plane for creating solid forms. Select the reference plane you added to the right and set its name parameter to right. Just hover over it. Once you, once you hover outside the dialog box, it changes it. Select the one near the top of the view and name it to back. And it changed, as you can see. And select the one near the bottom of the view and change uh, it to front or name it front. Now we're looking at this. Um, in plan view, right? We're looking to some plan view. And front is south, back is north, and left and right are east and west, west and east, respectively. So this is front. And sure enough, there it is. I select all of them. Uh, we could pin them in place, right, so they don't move. And we can't move them even if we wanted to, for now. Okay, so uh, activate the front elevation view and add another reference plane above and parallel to the reference uh, level. Again, the exact placement does not matter for now. Just make sure it is parallel to the level. In the properties palette, set the name parameter for this reference plane to top. So from a, uh, a front elevation view, right? From the front elevation view, which is right here, you can see these side reference planes. Right, right, left, center left, right. Well, from here, it wants to create another reference plane. So create a reference plane. The distance doesn't really matter. Just make sure it's parallel. And it is. This is the reference property for these new reference planes. Oh, wait, hold on. I change the page. Yeah. Name parameter for this reference plane is top. Right, so let's select it. Name. Top. This is reference property for these new reference planes. The. The is reference property for these new reference planes will be set to the default value of weak reference. The new, the reference property for these new reference planes, they have a, a typo. 
uh, weak reference. The reference property for these new reference planes will be set to the default value of weak reference. That is acceptable because these will be the major geometrical references of the table family. As an option, you can set the four reference planes in the plan view to strong. Reference and observe later how they behave in the project environment. All right, so the four, let's just, let's just keep them as weak references. So I select all of them. They're all, well, now I'm going to check this one. Is reference, is uh, reference. Weak, 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 and weak. I will experiment with that later. Using dimensions to control geometric parameters. Dimensions are useful for controlling the geometric parameters of your families. However, we recommend they be placed directly on reference planes and lines and not within the sketches of solid or void forms. When you start to construct a component family, you should first lay out any reference planes or lines and then add dimensions to the references, all before you create any solid geometry. As you complete the exercise steps in the section, you will be creating the framework for solid geometry that you will build in subsequent sections of this chapter. With the front elevation view still active, start the Align Dimensions command. You can access this command in the Measure panel of the Create tab in the ribbon, in the Annotate tab, or by pressing DI to activate the default keyboard shortcut. Place a dimension from the reference level to the reference plane level top as you previously created. So from the front elevation, create a dimension, Annotate, or DI, right? DI, practice my shortcut keys, from the reference level to the top. This process will consist of three mouse clicks, one on the reference level, one on the reference level datum object, right, one on the reference level datum object, one on the reference plane above, and the final click in open space to place the dimension string. Use the tab key to cycle through the selection options to help you pick, right, if you're over here and you want it to tab around to get a different line, you can tab through anything that's superimposed on something else. <laughs> Again, in CAD it has a uh, element selection tool that you have to keep on for that. Uh, okay, so press the escape key or click a modify in the ribbon to exit the dimension command. And then select the dimension you just placed. To make this dimension parametric, locate the Label Dimension panel and choose the Create Parameter tool. The Parameter Properties dialog box will appear shown in Figure 15.8 in the Name field, Type Height, and make sure the Type Radio button is selected. So that's up here. In the, uh, within the context of selecting the dimension, the Modify uh, Dimensions contextual toolbar opened up. And within that toolbar is a panel called Label Dimension, and you'll see there are parameters here. Uh, we are going to create a new parameter and make sure it's set to type, and we're going to call it height. And you can see it's already set to group the parameter under dimensions category, and again, there are a lot of them. So let's just give that an OK. As you can see, it's a dimension, uh, now it's a parameter. Click OK to continue. The dimension will now display with the prefix height. The exact height does not matter because you can control it later, through, later on through uh, parameter manipulation when we flex it. And we did this a little bit earlier on. And I've done this in the MP uh, tutorials as well. Activate the reference level floor plan. You now need to ensure that the four new reference planes are equally spaced around the two planes that define the family origin. After the equality constraints are established, you place dimensions to control the overall length and width of the shape. The order of this procedure, equality, and then overall dimension should be followed to establish the correct relationship with a center-based origin. Place and align the dimension between the three vertical reference planes and then click the EQ symbol near the dimension string. Repeat this process for the horizontal reference plane so the result looks like this. So 
we have an energy aligned here, 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 equality, here, 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 equidistant. Now, next, you will add the dimensions that will actually control the overall size of the shape and plan. Place the line dimensions between the outer two vertical reference planes, and then place the dimension between the outer two horizontal reference planes. So from here to here, and from here to here. Exit the dimension command and select the horizontal dimension string. From the label dimension create a uh, panel, create a new parameter. Name the new parameter length and then click OK. Repeat this process for the vertical dimension string and name the parameter width. So this is a type parameter and it's length. And this parameter is width. Should everything be parametric? When you start assigning dimensions to datum objects in your families, take a moment to think about whether you will need to modify those dimensions to create iterations of the component. Creating too many unnecessary labeled dimensions can make a family more complex, thus potentially degrading performance of your project files and potentially over-constraining your model. If the dimension is a fixed dimension that will not change between types, then either use an unlabeled dimension or do not dimension it at all. For example, in our table building exercise, the height might be fixed to two foot six. Therefore, the height parameter would not be needed. Modifying parameter design. Now that you've established some dimensions and assigned them to family parameters, it is time to flex the geometry, a term that has become popular with Revit users since the early adopt adoption years um, adoption years of the software. You flex your references by applying varying dimension values to confirm that no errors are generated and that the references are behaving the way you intended. Doing this early and often in the family building process reduces the chance of encountering a problem that you cannot solve later. When you have more forms and more complex parametric relationships, it becomes more difficult to unravel problematic geometry. There are two ways you can modify the parametric dimensions, thus flexing your family um, geometry. First, you can simply select a label dimension in the drawing area and enter a new value. The second way is different than in the project environment, where you must first select one of the objects and dimension references before editing the value. Although this method seems to be the easiest and most intuitive, you must be careful after you have established defined types within the family because direct manipulations of label dimensions will change the value of the active type. For this reason, we recommend you become accustomed to using the family types dialog box to flex your families. In the properties palette, click the family types command Move the dialog box off to the side so you can still see the drawing area and observe the reference planes and dimensions. In the Family Types dialog box, click the New button and create a new type named Type 1. Set the dimension parameters as follows and then click Apply. Okay, so Family Types allows you to enter parameter values to existing family types, add parameters to the family, or create new types within the family. In one family, you can create multiple family types where each type represents a different size or variation within the family. Use the family types tool to specify the parameters that define the differences between family types. Uh, we have this uh, family type. Now, as you can see, it's already kind of the dimensions are set, right? The default elevation is zero. Its height is three. We could flex it if we want. We could uh, move the box over here. Actually, let me make this a little smaller. Move the box over here a little bit. See so if I can get it small this way too. Yeah. So uh, if I was to flex the height, change this to four feet, and hit apply. Notice the uh, the height differential from three to four in the upper right hand dialog box. So that goes without saying, right? And then we could do we could test the width, fifteen feet length. Rather, I'll bring this down to ten feet. Constraints are not satisfied. 
Ten feet, let's see. Constraints are not satisfied. Well, that's the length parameter. Well, let's constrain it then. Let's see if I lock it, if that'll make a difference. Let's see, 10 feet. Or is it too, uh, is it too small, being that this is equidistant? No, that shouldn't be a problem. Why am I getting the, uh, why am I getting an error? Let me see the length parameter, equidistant, 15, bring this down to 10, which is five on both sides. Let me unlock it again. Center left, right. Actually, I'm not getting it, let's see. Dimensions, height, length. <laughs> let's see here. Let's try the width for a second. Let's do the width of six feet. Apply that. Constraints are not satisfied. Remove constraints. Constraints not satisfied, remove constraints. Let's try it again. Six, let's try five feet. No, something got screwed up. Ordinarily, that's a very simple thing to do. Uh, let's see here. Oh, it was a type parameter. It was a type, I, th I believe. I said, let's go to the new button. It was a type of parameter, not an instance. Okay, so it wants us to create a new type. Type one, okay. Set the dimension parameters as follows and click apply with two foot six. Length. Six foot. Height, two foot six. Okay. Click the new button again and create a new type named type two. Family type cannot be generated with the current parameters. Well, No, and why are those constraints? What did I do wrong? Weak reference, name left, doesn't define origin. Oh, I think it's because I may have pinned them. Maybe that is why. Let me select all instances, visible in view. I can't do that. So let me just select everything, but me select everything and then filter out the dimensions. I pin them. Maybe that's what it is. Let me turn off the dimensions. Hit apply. Hit OK. Unpin them. Well, that really overly constrained the model. So let me go back and see if I can flex now. Height we was fine. Length I wanted it at six feet. Yeah, okay. So I had it pinned. As you can see, the length was okay. The width, I'll change this to um oops. Change this to two feet. Uh, apply. And there we go. Alright, so let me undo out of there. Now, if we go back to here, do we have uh, any types? No, I cancel out of there. So the new one is type one. Hit OK. And its dimensions are two foot six, six foot, and two foot six. So a height of two foot six. A length of six foot. And two foot six for the width. And then another type. Type two, a width of three, eight and two foot six, a width 
of 3, a length of 8 foot, and a height of 2 foot 6, which is good. Apply. Okay. If the reference planes and dimensions were clear properly, you should not receive any error messages. Oops. While you are flexing the parameters, if you do receive any errors, you could delete the dimensions and even the reference planes and start over. If this were to happen later in the process, it would be more difficult to resolve the problem. You ain't getting it. All right, so um, type name. In the previous exercise, you created two types within the family, simply named type 1 and type 2. You might have also noticed that other families in the default libraries have type names that indicate some sort of size information. For example, the door family single flush has types named according to the respective length and width, such as 36 by 84. The problem here is that the type name is not automatically linked to any parameters in the family. Therefore, if a parameter value is modified and the type is not renamed, the situation can become confusing to users working in your project. However, since this is a common feature for selecting doors, we recommend naming it based on how it would be easiest to select it in the project. If you choose name based on parameters that can change, make sure to, you, to verify those properties. A door schedule would be great for this. There is no single correct answer to the type naming conundrum. You can use specific name, uh, specific type names, 36 by 84, to help the users of your content decide which type to select, or you can choose generic names, type 1, to avoid conflicts. One possible conflict could arise if you use the type name of a family in a schedule. For example, if you generated a door schedule that used the, the type name instead of the actual width and height parameters, there might be inconsistency with the actual dimensions versus those in the user-defined name. A relatively safe methodology is to use more detailed type naming conventions, such as material nominal size, to help content users better understand the available choices. An example for a door family might be wood, 36 by 84, as a standard practice. Do not use the type name in any schedules for production documentation. Reviewing the differences between type and instance parameters. In the previous exercise, you created a few dimension-based parameters that were set to be type parameters. Let's review the difference between a type parameter and an instance parameter, keeping in mind that they can be switched at just about any time. The key difference between the two is that modifying a type parameter always modifies all instances of the type. Think of a type as a set of identical elements. Change one item in the set and all the other items of that type in the model change to match. Door sizes are a good example of this. Doors come in standard sizes, 32, 34, 36, or 800, 850, and 900 millimeters. On the other hand, an instance parameter modifies only the instances that you have selected. A good use of an instance parameter would be the fire rating of a door. Not every 36 inch, 900 millimeter door will be fire rated. So you'll need to individually identify which ones, which ones are. Um, just give me a second here. shows us a, an example of a curtain wall door family, showing the parameters of the default. The parameters that have the notation default are instance parameters. There are other parameters that can be used to report dynamic values from within the family. These are shown with the report notation. In the example of a standard door, dimensions such as width, height, and thickness should be, would be established as type parameters because you would not want to use the what you would not want users to create random or arbitrary values. Also be aware that once a parameter is created, only some asset aspects of the parameter can be modified. You cannot change the discipline or type of parameter value after the parameter has been created. Uh, sorting parameters. All right, so um, we're going to need to uh, stop this here because I wanted to open up a curtain wall door and, and get into the dialog box that does indeed show this. But uh, again, um, there are two types within this uh, family. So if we had an open project file, new project, I could call this one architectural template. Okay. Now, being that we're back in the uh, 
this parametric family that we created, zoom all, uh, WTZA, we have the project open, right, project five, and we have this parametric family with two types, if I remember correctly. So allow us to then go back here and load into family, load into project, right? Allow us to load this into the project, family type three, where you could see this type one and this type two, right? So there's nothing there, as you can see. Uh, it's, it's in there, but there's nothing, there's no geometry. There's no geometry. But there are two types, and it's the same concept, you know, with the uh, with every family. Um, you'll be able to manipulate all that good stuff and build your own content. A catalog, if you will. A catalog. So um, getting into uh, modifying parametric dimensions, revealing the differences between type and instance parameters, and sorting and, and, and using type catalogs we're going to get into in the next section, because we just it just keeps going and going. Um, and I don't want to, I'm going to set a delineation line so we can absorb that. All right, so just take that um, verbatim. It's uh, going to be an important aspect of this. If indeed you're, uh, you're going to be in the content creation business.